In today's video, we have the latest NHL trade rumors. Today, we're focusing on teams like the Montreal Canadiens, the New York Rangers, and the Colorado Avalanche. We also have a story involving former half Michael Froelich, who's blaming the half for essentially ending his NHL career. We also have word that many NHL sponsors have put the league on notice about potentially pulling out based on the whole Blackhawks scandal. We also have updates on the Blackhawks coaching situation, as well as the GM role, as well as some injuries and more. All that coming up next. Welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL news and trade rumors to talk about here today. Uh, let's kick things off with an interesting article here uh, regarding former Montreal Canadian and longtime NHL forward Michael Froelich. And I will put a link to this uh, article down below in the pinned comment if you want to re uh, read through it. It's from uh, TVA from uh, obviously Quebec Media, uh, interviewing the former half forward who essentially blames the Montreal Canadiens organization for essentially ending his NHL career and essentially what the gist of it is is that they signed him to a one-year contract basically a league minimum last year but he barely saw the ice he barely played uh, and a lot of that was due to the fact that their salary cap situation was extremely tight that they were very limited on call-ups and who could be called up when because the dollars had to fit not just so much on who they wanted but like I said it was more about money than anything else when it came down to their cap situation. So I guess in a way, Froelich is kind of confused as to why they even signed him. And because of the lack of playing time and limited role he had, he really couldn't, uh, you know, impress anybody else to give him a future NHL opportunities is kind of the gist of where he's going with his comments here. Now playing overseas in Europe uh, and blames Montreal basically uh, for everything that went down and not being able to continue on with his career. Like he said after he was signed, they didn't, not long after that signed Corey Perry, who essentially got more playing time than he did. And then, like I said, as well, he was on the taxi squad uh, last year when they had that, of course. And he barely got called up. They were bringing in other players and moving him up from the minors to the taxi squad and then to the NHL roster back and forth. And he was sitting most nights. Uh, and we also saw the same thing happen with Cole Caulfield and other guys, too, who had to sit out a lot, too, because they didn't have the space to call them up. So obviously their contracts all played a big role in who could actually play and he's not happy about it. And there's obviously, a, you know, basically sitting out majority of the year, it didn't do himself any favors to generate any other NHL interest. Uh, he didn't put up any points in the games he did play. I mean, at the same time, I'm not entirely convinced he would have got another opportunity anyway. Uh, he did split the season be before that between Calgary and Buffalo. But clearly he feels if he would have given more playing time and more opportunity, he probably could have continued on his career. And, uh, you know, now he's, I believe, 33 years old and playing in Europe. So it likely spells the end of things in the NHL for Fro League. So in a way, it's confusing as to why they signed him. But you know what? They might not have known the, the option to get Corey Perry. Uh, and, of course, you know, they did know their cap situation was tight. And the other thing he also said, too, was that they offered him league minimum because they said it's really all they could afford. And he kind of thought based on his conversations with management that he had a role in like a regular spot to go to. And then he goes to training camp and he doesn't get that at all. Ends up on the taxi squad sitting out majority of the year. So overall, certainly not a great experience for Froelich. And uh, now he's uh, not real happy about it. But I can kind of understand. But at the same time, uh, you know, with the Hab situation, I kind of understand their side of it as well. But maybe they shouldn't be making promises if they can't keep them. But of course, we weren't part of those conversations. So it's really hard to confirm 100% what he was told or led to expect going into that season. Now, a few other quick notes here as well. Uh, Devils forward Miles Wood is going to be out indefinitely. Uh, he's been having issues with a hip uh, and that is now going to require surgery and it's going to be out for an extended time but they haven't been able to, to you know, put a, a definite timeline on it. But we are looking at, uh, you know, multiple months here likely. Uh, hip surgeries are a pretty big recovery. So uh, for Miles Wood, that's certainly not good. Uh, you know, he's a, a young uh, forward who certainly is afraid, not afraid to play a physical style of game and certainly is uh, taking its toll on his body in his young career. Uh, the Ottawa Senators are dealing with a bit of a COVID outbreak situation after returning from their first 
road trip to the United States in a couple of years. Uh, they now have, I believe, four uh, players and coaches in COVID protocol. Start with forward Austin Watson, uh, and then it's spread to associate coach uh, Jack Capuano, uh, followed by Connor Brown and Nick Holden. So the four of them are all in COVID protocols. They've had to call up a few players for their game in Boston tomorrow uh, versus the Bruins. So that's certainly uh, not a good thing. They uh, canceled practice today just from a cautionary perspective, uh, you know, kind of keep everybody separate. And when they go on their road trip uh, to Boston, there will be no, um, you know, nothing outside of the hotel. They're going to be having dinner at the hotel and staying put, and there will be nothing, um, you know, really going on, even though that, you know, obviously they're fully vaccinated. So they do have a little bit of liberty to get around and do more things than they did last year, but they're going to be taking her easing and cautious here, considering what's already run through the team. Because at this point, they're, they certainly are concerned about having more positive cases pop up here. Habs goalie Carey Price will officially return to the team to practice tomorrow. Uh, he was uh, making an appearance, I believe, today at the practice facility, but uh, really just to get checked and to get cleared to return. But uh, his full uh, first full practice day with the team will be tomorrow. Like I mentioned before, it's likely going to be some time before we see him in game action. He'll need some time to kind of get reacclimated and practice and all that. Hard to say exactly what kind of timeline we're looking at, but I'm probably at minimum of a week. I would say probably closer to a week and a half to two, but that's just my estimation. I'm not really sure where things will go. I'm sure they're quite happy to have him back. I know I heard teammate Brendan Gallagher make mention of the fact that, uh, you know, it's nice and great to get him back and everything like that, but certainly they have enough motivation from their lack of success this year to kind of keep pushing forward. And certainly I don't really think it's fair to say goaltending has really been an issue. I think with Jake Allen playing the bulk of the games, I think he's been pretty good, but the team in front of them, both uh, defensively and offensively, have had their fair share of struggles. So I'll be interested to see. It's just having Price around and from a leadership perspective and, you know, all that uh, could make a difference because they're certainly without a lot of their veteran leaders from last year who helped take them to the finals. You take away Carey Price, you take away Shea Weber, you take away Corey Perry. Makes a big difference in the dressing room and just, uh, you know, the way the whole culture and feel of the team. So we'll be interested to see what kind of positive impact he can have on the team getting uh, back into action here. A uh, quick update as well on the situation with Chicago. Of course, we know that they recently, uh, you know, had Stan Bowman resign because of the whole scandal. Then they fired Jeremy Colleton. Uh, now they both have new people in those roles as GM and coach, but they're both on, uh, on an interim basis. We've got uh, Kyle Davidson in the GM role, and of course, Derek King in the head coaching role. Uh, both are likely going to be expected here to ride it out through the season, and we're likely going to see uh, them be in the mix for those permanent roles, as well as probably a few others uh, in the offseason. At least that's what things are looking like. I know Derek King essentially has been led to believe that at this point he will be the coach for the rest of the year. Um, if things go well and they're happy with him, they'll likely remove the interim tag in the offseason. At least that's the way things are looking at this point. Uh, I know the players seem to have a little bit of Basically, instant credibility and respect for him, given the fact that he had a fairly long career himself and has been obviously in the coaching world for a while as well. Uh, they won his first game behind the bench, which was good. Uh, I know the, the, the initial feedback is very positive on how he handles the players and talking to them, keeping things light and all that. So we'll see where that goes. And in the case of Davidson as the GM, uh, based on how he's talking, based on the, the comments he's made, it sounds like uh, Danny Wirtz has given him full autonomy uh, to kind of make all the decisions, including big important ones. Like he doesn't need to necessarily have ownership sign off on everything or anything like that even though he's not considered in a, a permanent job role with, as the general manager at the moment uh, I would imagine though we will see the Blackhawks likely pick away at things but they're probably going to ride things out I'd say probably another at least seven to ten games is the most likely scenarios we talked about yesterday before we see too much because if the Hawks can get things turned around and get a few wins in the win column get themselves a little bit more respectable record here maybe they can ride things out and try to make a late season push I don't know but they'll have to kind of gauge what's best you, you almost don't want to get caught in the middle here you either want to be a sure playoff team or you kind of want to tank almost so that you get the better draft pick it's a deep draft and if they go all the way to the bottom and can secure one of the top couple of picks in the draft they can keep their first round pick because of course they traded their first rounder for seth jones to the jackets but of course it is protected in those lottery selections so if it ends up in the first couple selections they can keep it and defer the pick and get themselves quite an impact player so that would probably be ideal considering where things are at today. We'll have to wait and see where things go on that front. But uh, certainly expect these guys to be in their positions um, for the rest of the year and kind of audition here to see where things go. So that tells me I can't imagine an interim GM 
making a significant trade like a Taves or a Kane, but I would imagine they'll kind of touch around the edges here uh, instead of look around some of the other, um, you know, not necessarily core pieces, but you're looking at your guys like your Calvin DeHaan, your Ryan Carpenters, uh, maybe even Dominic Kubelik. Kubelik was another guy mentioned by Scott Powers in the Athletic article that we talked yesterday. It could be a very interesting piece to many NHL teams. I mean, it's a former 30 goal score on a decent contract. It might not come at too high of a price. I mean, he'll have a higher price tag like than a DeHaan or a Strom or a Carpenter, but still, like he's a guy who you know can play a top six role and be more of an impact player. So to me, he's one of the more interesting players to watch as we get later into the season at the deadline. I know some feel he could be a core piece and he might turn out to be, but that's what a lot of this new coach and GM needs to determine is who are the guys you're going to keep. That's easier to kind of nail down than who you're going to trade and everybody else kind of becomes expendable if the right deals and right price tags can be found I guess is what the way you look at it I mean you're looking at guys like Kirby Doc and Alex Dabrinkit likely you're not going anywhere they would be a couple of key players to build around uh, obviously Seth Jones has signed that mega mammoth contract he's likely not going anywhere but outside of that you know with the exception of maybe Kubalik but many feel he could be moved then you're looking at pretty much almost everybody else on the roster outside of their top prospects being you know potential trade bait and they won't trade everybody of course there's not going to be you know a market for everybody but you know there will be for a decent amount and then i would imagine once we have a permanent gm in tow then there's always whether it's davidson or somebody else they'll have to determine uh you know the future of guys like kane and taves they got one year left on their deal after this would they consider retaining some salary to move them on to kind of bring in a whole new era here i mean i think we're going to see the blackhawks once we have this uh, guys in their new permanent roles really try to do a major culture shift and kind of repair the image of this team after everything has been through off the ice. Wouldn't be surprised if they consider a logo change. Wouldn't be surprised if they do a lot of off ice stuff, obviously to kind of, you know, kind of regain trust in the community, get the fans back because that's obviously having a major impact and they're going to have to do a lot of work to make that happen. So it's going to be a big job and a big task to fix the product off the ice as well as on the ice. So we'll see where things go on that front. Now, before we jump into the trade rumors for the day, uh, regarding the uh, teams like Montreal, Colorado, and the Rangers, I do want to pause for a moment and acknowledge our channel sponsor, Manscaped. Top Shelf Hockey is proud to be sponsored by Manscaped. And guess what? Hockey fans are buzzing because hockey is back. Want to know what else is buzzing? The Lawnmower 4.0 from our friends at Manscaped, who are the global leaders in male grooming, trusted by over 2 million men worldwide. I highly recommend the Performance Package 4.0, which includes their new state-of-the-art lawnmower 4.0, as well as some other great features. The lawnmower itself has a 7,000 RPM motor, a new multifunction switch that can engage as a travel lock, gives you the ability to turn on an LED spotlight as well for a more precise shave. Uh, also, as I've mentioned on numerous occasions before, Manscaped is about much more than just a trimmer. They have everything, all aspects aspects covered and male grooming including some great formulations like their brand new ultra premium body wash to keep you smelling great all day long it's certainly a big hit here i absolutely love it they also have other exfoliators and gels to keep all aspects of your grooming needs covered i highly recommend you check out manscape.com use promo code tsh for 20 percent off and free shipping that's 20 percent off and free shipping at manscape.com using promo code tsh all right, thanks very much for watching our promotional content. I do greatly appreciate it. Now, into the other trade rumors of the day. I want to take a look at the Montreal Canadiens and the potential link to the New York Rangers here. We're looking at defenseman Ben Sherrod. Of course, we know the Montreal Canadiens have had a pretty terrible start to the season. They're obviously way lower in the standings than they ever probably would have projected themselves to be. I think after having a run to the Stanley Cup Finals last year, it's fair to say that they had some pretty high expectations for themselves, as probably the likely the fan base did as well. Now, of course... If things don't get turned around here soon, I expect, like we talked about with Chicago, we're going to see some some trades, obviously, to, to kind of shake things up and move some players out to kind of start doing a little bit of a reset. And obviously, players on you know expiring contracts or not much term left will be your most likely candidates to get traded. It's already been reported by a few sources, including Arthur Staple of The Athletic, that Ben Sherratt is garnering some interest around the league, especially in the New York area. He mainly linked him to the New York Rangers, but I wouldn't be surprised if even a team like the Islanders are taking a look at him as well. Uh, both teams are looking to bolster their D. Uh, both teams are looking for something a little bit different, though. The Rangers are mainly looking for a defenseman to play on the third pair. Uh, they've been kind of rotating between Nils Lundqvist 
guys like Patrick Nemeth and, um, you know, other younger defensemen. And they kind of want a more of a veteran guy to kind of in and kind of stabilize that third pair uh, and be, you know, be able to play a little bit more of defensive hockey. So obviously Sherrod can certainly be capable of that. He's played top four minutes for quite a long time between his time in Montreal and prior to that with the Winnipeg Jets. So it certainly fits the bill. In the case of the Islanders, I'm not sure he's the perfect candidate to really what they're looking for. I can understand why there might be some linkage there. They certainly would like a top 4D, but ideally I think somebody who can be a little bit more offensive and, and kind of move the puck more. And Sherratt isn't exactly, that's not his strongest suit for sure. So, I mean, he'd be okay there, but I think there might be some different better options out there when it comes to them but even a team like say ottawa for example also not far from montreal needs a, a some help on a blue line their defense has been a bit of a mess the vets they have there have not been really working out for them uh, and he might be a guy that they could look to uh, to also kind of stabilize that second pair if you leave thomas shabbat with artem zub they've been pretty solid but after that the ones behind them have struggled and if a guy like maybe Eric Brandstrom could play with a guy like Sherratt, I'm not sure that'd be a good pair. But then, you know, you can kind of, you need your stabilizing D to work with your offensive D. And that's what the Senators are missing. Their defensive style guys are just not cutting it. So the offensive zone guys uh, that are more capable of, uh, you know, scoring and producing scoring chances are just not getting it done. So at the end of the day here, there's no, uh, uh, there's certainly plenty of interest in Sherratt. Uh, so he could be a guy from Montreal as a prime trade target. I know they've had their, their blue line last year in the playoffs was their strong suit. And obviously, without having Weber there, if they trade Sherratt, that kind of leaves uh, you know two of your big four already out of the mix. Uh, David Savard, in my opinion, hasn't really been a great ideal replacement. We know he wasn't going to be Shea Weber. That's no big surprise. But I, I thought he would have fit in better. But not really sure what, what's going on with Savard. I'm not sure if it's a conditioning thing. But just hasn't been really as, as good as I think they were hoping he would be back there so certainly the team is uh you know not having a great start like i said and of course evanson being out for an extended time there to start the year didn't help matters either they've had their fair share of adversity we'll see if they can bounce back but if not like chicago i would expect montreal to be looking to be sellers as we get closer to the deadline and you're going to have some prime guys like Sherratt likely on the move now the other team i want to talk about here is the avalanche now of course we know and we get confirmation from jack eichel himself that uh, during the jack eichel sweepstakes the avalanche were certainly a team in the mix we've had those conversations before based on trade rumors that were in the rumor mill i know some obviously were more likely to think that they were true than others but certainly we know that they were because eichel himself said in an interview with elliot friedman that there was a time when he thought for sure he was going to be a colorado avalanche uh, but the deal never got finalized now, according to uh, Avalanche writer Mike Chambers from the Denver Post, he believes the package that the Avalanche were kind of putting on the table to kind of get into those Eichel conversations and the sweepstakes here was uh, young defenseman Samuel Gerrard, along with a top prospect and a couple of high picks, likely first rounders, possibly with conditions attached. So Gerrard being the main roster player, of course, he comes with term and a decent contract. That would have been, you know, a, a decent offer. Obviously, probably not as good as the one who got the deal done, of course. But this goes to show and tell us here that the Avalanche would be willing to trade Samuel Gerrard. Now, in the offseason, I know we looked at some Avalanche trade rumors before. And I know myself, just strictly on my own opinion, said I honestly thought that the uh, the Avalanche were going to look to kind of rejig their blue line and that Gerrard might be the guy to go. Now, of course, they ended up trading Ryan Graves instead, which certainly... Was a bit of a surprise to me, but I can understand the desire to keep Gerard. But obviously, with Graves being like the you know the bigger, stronger, more physical type compared to the smaller, uh, offensive-minded Gerard, uh, I thought they might go in a different direction. But clearly, they didn't. They thought Graves would get snatched in the expansion draft if they couldn't protect him, so they moved him on to the Devils, which was a great deal for New Jersey, by the way. Um, and I think he's he's doing well there in his current role. Um, but now, of course, whether considering maybe making another big move. We know the Avalanche have really not pulled off a significant major trade in some time, but every big name that's been available over the past one to two years, they've been in the mix and they've been sniffing around trying to improve their team and get over that hump to become a Stanley Cup champion. So many still feel, including Chambers here in this article, that there's a good chance that the Avs are going to try to either uh, possibly add another goaltender if they're not quite pleased enough with Darcy Kemper or they might try to add another uh, you know, elite type of scoring forward. So if they do that, they're going to have to get really good value. They're going to have to give up good value. And he feels that Sam Gerrard 
might be that guy that they're willing to dangle to make that happen. Now, I would not say that they're out there actively shopping, Gerard. I don't believe that to be the case at all here. But if they can find the right deal to add this other impact player that they feel they need to become that true Stanley Cup contender that many pegged him to be this year, but they haven't really shown yet, that he might be the trade chip they use to try to make that happen. Clearly with guys like Kiel McCarr back there and Devon Taves and Bowen Byram certainly looking pretty solid in his young career. That kind of makes a, you know an offensively a great skating D like Gerard a little bit expendable knowing that you have three other guys that can do a very similar job. And of course they need some size and strength and physicality and stronger defensive minded players back there to kind of you know balance things out on that blue line. So it makes sense that you know, as much as he's a good player for them and they really value him, if they turned him into an elite goaltender or top six forward, that very well might be a move that they're willing to make. It makes a lot of sense. So I certainly concur with the thoughts here in the article from uh, the Denver Post of Mike Chambers. So let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.